Once again, we have been blessed by God to be here tonight. And again, I am grateful. I want to thank several individuals for making my stay comfortable. I want to thank Brother Sam for taking me and Kevin to work out during the day. We've had a great time fellowshipping and worshiping with you. And we just thank God for your presence tonight. I'm excited once again as we look into the word of God. Our theme has been this week, where are you going? Where are you going? I want you to turn with me to your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 7 as we begin tonight. 2 Kings chapter 7, and I want to read verses 1 through 4 in your hearing by way of getting into our message tonight. 2 Kings chapter 7, where are you going? That's our theme. I want to read 2 Kings chapter 7. 7, beginning with verse 1 in your hearing, I would like to read as you follow along with me in your Bibles. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thy eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Remember that. Thou shalt see it with your eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Verse 3, and there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, why sit here until we die? Why sit here until we die? If we say we enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. If we shall die there, and if we sit here, we will die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall onto the host of the Syrians. And if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Tonight's subject, I want to entitle it, Where Do We Go From Here? Where do we go from here? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving Lord, once again, I thank you for the awesome privilege to open your word. Once again, your people wait in anticipation to hear a word from the Lord. Lord, I ask once again that you would use me one more time and help me to remember that I'm only the fork, I'm not the food. Help me, Lord, to be thoughtful and mindful of the reality that I'm only the mailman, I'm not the message. And after once again we have heard your word, we will give you the glory and the honor for the great things you shall do for us tonight. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Where do we go from here? There are many of you who have come to this encampment and you have already been challenged by God to live right. You come from a past full of pain and heartache. And now you're asking yourself the question, with all the truths you have been presented, with all the knowledge of God, where do we go from here? You see, my brothers and sisters, the reality is this. You cannot take new wine and put it in old bottles lest it burst. You cannot take this Christian experience that God has given you and go back into the old way of living or you will lose your mind. As I said before, there is this thing called cognitive dissonance. You either will change what you believe or you will change your life. There is a tension there. You know how things ought to be. And then you live with the reality of how things are. And if you don't change your behavior, then you're going to try to change your rules and regulations and your morality. Or you're going to change your life. Tonight we are faced with an important question, and that is, where do we go from here? Looking at our lives, you've come too far to turn back now. God has brought you too far. You've come this far by faith. 
God has opened up doors. God has blessed you. God has shine, shown his favor on you. God has opened up doors that no man can close. And God has closed doors that no man can open. You mean to tell me tonight that all the blessings that God has given you, there's no way in the world you can afford to turn back now. In fact, they tell me that if you turn around, it's like going back to your own vomit. It's like going back to a world of sin. You have come too far now to turn back. And so the question is, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, I would like to suggest that if you're going to go anywhere, you must always act on the word of God. And if you do not act on the word of God, any action at all is presumption. Whenever there is faith, faith must always be preceded by the word of God. When there is no word of God, there can be no faith. And when there is no word of God, there is only presumption. Tonight, young people as well as old people are asking the question about their lives. Where do I go from here? How can I order my steps? What do I do with my life? I only have one life to live. And what do I do now? Well, let me tell you, first of all, you must hear the voice of God. Whenever God's voice comes to you, he's going to give direction and he's going to open up doors and blessings will come. Now, I'm telling you this by way of introduction because all this is is the thesis of my message. Whenever God tells you to do something, he's always going to provide a way for you in order that you might do what he's asking you to do. God is never going to call you to do something without making a way. And I'm so glad that we have the Bible to validate and to authenticate what I'm trying to say to you tonight. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, but I'm going to do what the Bible says. In all thy ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your steps. Tonight, somebody needs to know that even though they're facing obstacles, even though perplexities are in front of them, if you keep moving forward, as I said last night, the door of faith will open and God will honor your life and will bless you. But you can't turn around now. How do we proceed? How do we move forward? Well, in order to set this up, you need to see the context of this story. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there was a man of God named Elisha. God had blessed this man of God. In fact, he had received a double portion of God's spirit from Elijah. He had been blessed by God. He was Elijah's understudy. Elijah was his mentor. And now he was filled with the Holy Ghost. God had blessed Elisha and God has used Elisha. In fact, in chapter 6 of verse 8 of 2 Kings, go with me as we set the context. I need to set the table before we get the blessing. The Bible says, then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, in such a such place shall be the camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, beware that thou pass not such a place for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice, but on several occasions, the man of God saved the king of Israel from some mishaps. In other words, if you look at this correctly, God says tonight in his word that the king of Syria was warring against the Israelites. And somehow the king of Syria, he was talking to his men. He was telling them what we're going to do. We're going to go down to such and such place and we're going to war against the children of Israel. The man of God had gotten some information download from the Holy Ghost, told him where they were going to go. And this prophet of God went back to the king of Israel and said, look, my brother, don't go that way because when you go that way, they're going to be waiting in ambush. And if you go that way, they're going to take your life. And so the king of Israel listened not once, not twice, but on several occasions he was delivered because he listened to the man of God. Tonight it is un unfortunate that somebody is going to make a mess of their lives because they refuse to listen to the voice of God. Whenever you listen to God's voice, you will avoid heartache, heartbreak, 
pain, mistakes, and delay of doing the will of God. Tonight, I'm so glad that we have the Bible, and the Bible says that God warned his people through this man of God who was a prophet, and I'm glad tonight that God sent a little lady named Ellen White to warn this church of some last day events. He warned this church about things in our own life. You know, at Seventh-day Adventist, there's no reason in the world for us to have shaky homes and terrible lives and sorry houses. God has given us through this woman Adventist home, message to young people, child guidance, messages on health, temperance, and on and on and on. And the Bible says tonight, if you want to be established, you've got to believe God and his prophets. You see, tonight, if you listen to God, he is going to warn you and he's going to tell you how to navigate your life through this world. There is something I do with young people. And what I do, do an illustration, I have them put on a blindfold. And I, and I did this with my sons at a school where they go. I have three boys. And I had all three of them stand on one end of the room. And I stood on the other end of the room. And what I did, I put on them blindfolds. And once I blindfold my oldest son, I would strategically place down paper on the floor. Eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And I would write on them different things. I would write gossip, sin. Drugs, alcohol, dope, disobedient to parents. And then I would strategically place those pieces of paper down on the floor. And then I would get to the other end of the room and the class, the class, their, their, their classmates would be sitting out in the audience. And I would say to them, I'm going to get my sons to heaven. Now, in order for them to get to heaven, they have to listen to my voice. And I said, now watch this. And my first son, he would have the blindfold on his eyes. And I said, now, son, in order for you to get to me, I represent heaven. Now, you've got to listen to my voice. Whatever you do, do not do your own thing. Now, if you step on one piece of paper, you're gonna, it's going to be like stepping on a mine, and your life is going to become a statistic. Unfortunately, there are human beings on planet Earth who step on minds because they don't listen to God and their lives become statistics. They become messed up. They become terribly in, in, in trouble and perplexity because they did their own thing. God says, I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to keep you from some mess, but you won't listen. And so I say to my son, now, son, what I want you to do, I want you to raise your left hand. He raised his left hand and said, now I want you to take one step to your left. And he takes one step to his left. I said, now, son, take two steps forward. He takes two steps forward. And then I said, now I want you to go to your right. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you go to your right, raise your right hand because I don't want to take anything for granted. I'm glad tonight that God never takes us for granted and he makes sure that we know our left from our right before he ever gives us the command. And so I say to my son, now raise your right hand. He raised his right hand. I say, now go to your right. I say, take one step to your right. He takes one step to his right. Now I get him halfway and then I say, now, son, you on your own. Come on to heaven. Now, quite naturally, with those papers on the floor, he tries to make it and he thinks he can navigate himself around it. But he ends up stepping on something and boom, it's over. I say, OK, now you out the way. I said that my next son. I said, now, come on, you gone. Your life messed up. You messed up. You couldn't make it. You didn't make it. Now I say to my next son, my middle son, I say, now, come on, Ronnie, what I want you to do, I'm not going to give you any instructions at all. I want you to try to get to heaven on your own. Now, I would rearrange the paper because, you know, he was taking mental notes. He's looking down, seeing where they were, seeing where they are, and then he gets the blindfold on. But I've already changed them up on him already. And see, that's how life is. God somehow wants to navigate us through life, and the devil knows how to change up the game plan. So what one person might avoid, you you can't do what they do. You've got to listen to God on your own and let him navigate your life. That's important. That's important because, see, what might not be convicting one person can be convicting another person. And as, as members in the church, we have to be careful that we don't make our convictions the law. Amen, somebody. You know how it is somebody gets the victory over eating flesh meat? And then we want to make a law and we come back and we want to preach to the whole church and send everybody to hell because they don't have the victory like I have the victory. 
or somebody get the victory over sweet or somebody stop drinking with their meals or somebody overcome certain things. And all of a sudden, they are so holy, sanctified, washed in the blood of Christ, and they want to make their convictions a law and they become a pain in the neck. Amen. Now, it's wonderful to get the victory, but just because you have grown a little faster than somebody else, don't put everybody else down because we all grow at a different rate. And the fact is, if we're walking with God, we all going to grow. And so I tell my next son, I say, now you do it on your own. Before he even gets off the block, he steps on something. Boom. I say, oh, you out the way. You done messed up. And now my last son, the youngest son, and I use him as an example because it doesn't matter how young you are or how inexperienced you are. The point is, if you listen to God, you can make it through this life. I put the blindfold over his eyes and I say to him, Reggie, now what I want you to do is take one step to the left. He takes one step to the left. I said, now what I want you to do is take three steps forward. He takes three steps forward. And he almost come close to something. And don't you know the class, they, the class almost makes a sigh. The whole class say, Ooh. And don't you know that's what the angels do in heaven when they're watching you and God is telling you what to do and, and you come close to getting close to something and they, they be, the, the people, the angels up in heaven say, please don't. And you get close to something and the angels say, Ooh. Thank God they didn't do it. And they're watching us. And all of a sudden, you, you take another step. And the angels are watching. The whole class, they were on their tiptoes. In fact, it got so intense, everybody in the class came up front. And they were looking on. Don't you know we are a spectacle to the world? The unfallen beings are looking at you. They're checking you out. You are a written epistle of God. And the angels who are not in sin, the angels who are unfallen, they're on their tiptoes looking at you saying, oh, please, watch it, watch it. And they're cheering for you. And they're watching us. And the whole class, every time Reggie passed something, the class say, yay, pray. They start giving each other high five. That's what the angels do in heaven. When you overcome something, I can see the angels now. They flip about three light years into another galaxy and give each other, bam, high five. Praise God. He made it. That's what they do. God is cheering for us. And I say to my son, I say, come on, Reggie. You can make it. Now, don't give up now. Listen to me. And he, you can hear Reggie sign. Ooh. Ooh, I said, come on, bread, don't get weary and well doing. He that shall come will come and will not tarry long, have faith. And so, Reggie, and all of a sudden, I get fancy. I get fancy with, and sometimes God gets fancy with us, saints. He wants us to do some great things. And right, and Reggie was right in front of a piece of paper just like this. And, and the class was looking. They were like, they, they didn't know what he was going to do. And I said, Reggie, now this is going to be a big one. We want a miracle on this one. I said, Reggie, what I want you to do, I want you to just jump up and go forward about a foot. Now, I'm saying in my mind, I hope you know what a foot is. I hope you don't go a yard. And so I said, come on, Reggie, just do a foot. I want to get fancy. And sometimes God wants to use some of us and show us off. He wants to get fancy with us in our lives, and he wants to show us off. And so, Lord, and, and so I said, I said, come on, Reggie. And, and Reggie, Reggie this. He said, okay, okay. He, and he jumped right over the paper, and the class just went crazy. They just started jumping up all over again. Oh, he made it. Praise God. And then right at the end, Reggie got about a couple of feet from me, and I said to him, there was nothing in the way. There were papers on both sides, and I said to myself, I said, now, I'm going to really show him. I said, okay, now, Reggie, now just take off and run. I said, take off and run, and he was right, right here, and, and he took off, and he ran, and, and when I was waiting for him, I grabbed him up in my arms, and I said, you made it, and I swung him, you made it to heaven. We just start partying. We just start partying. Hey, you made it. That's what God does. All heaven rejoices when one sinner makes it. God is happy when you make it. But saints of God, I'm come here to tell you tonight, you've got to listen to the voice of God. If you're going to make it around the booby traps that the devil has set for you, you've got to listen to God or you're going to mess up in your life. Listen to what the word of God says again now by way of redundancy. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel saying, beware, beware. They're setting up a booby trap for you, king of Israel. They're setting it up. Watch it. And he says in verse 10, and the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself. Tonight, if you listen, God can save you. Unfortunately, we had a mishap last night. And those somebody, I won't say young men because that's stereotyping. Some sisters could have stolen this stuff. We don't know. <laughs> But the fact is, somebody stole, somebody came in in the cloak of darkness and took something that did not belong to them. 
And unfortunately, they think they're getting away, but they're not. They think they're getting away, but they're not. What's going to happen is there's going to be a snowball effect and whatever you do, it's going to come back on you. God is not mocked. Whatever you plant, it's going to grow. You may not think it's going to come back, but it's going to show up when you least expect it. It's the boomerang. It's the boomerang effect. You see, you throw things out and it's going to come back. You might not expect you throw it out today. Ten years from later, you're walking around, bam, right upside the head. You say, whoa, what happened? It comes back at you. That's what, that's what happens. And see, some people want to complain and say life is hard. No, no, no. Life is not hard. Life is neutral. You know what makes life hard? Making dumb decisions. That's what makes life hard. That's what you do dumb things and get dumb consequences. And then you want to blame God for life. Life is wonderful. In fact, life is a piece of cake. Sometime this week, I'm going to share with you how to make sure you can govern your life and get the best results because there are fixed laws that govern our law, our lives. And when you cooperate with those fixed laws, joy, happiness and success is inevitable. I'll show you from the pen of inspiration, the book Prophets and Kings about Shadrach, Daniel, about Meshach, was it Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach and a bad Negro. I mean, a Bendigo. Yeah. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Those brothers was awesome. Those, those brothers were bad. They, 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 were, they, they knew how to obey God, and they got success as a result of that. And I'm saying tonight, if we learn how to cooperate with those fixed laws, success is inevitable. I guarantee you. There are fixed laws that if you cooperate with, success is inevitable. I'll talk about that maybe tomorrow night sometime. But, but God has something for us tonight to see. Notice. It says there, therefore, verse 11, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. This thing bothered him. He said, how in the world is this king of Israel knowing what I'm doing? How is he figuring me out? I don't understand it. I do this and then all of a sudden he figures it out. You see, we are not ignorant as, as, as brother Kevin Herring said on the other day. One morning he said, we're not ignorant concerning the devices of the devil. See, the devil is laying booby traps. And if we're not in the spirit realm, he's going to get us. But if we are in the spirit realm with God, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities. And the only one who knows how to fight the spiritual warfare is God. We're no match for the devil. We don't have insight. We don't know what he's going to do next. We don't know what he's going to pull off next. The devil is not omnipresent, nor is he omniscient. He, does, he can't read your mind, but he can watch your gestures and tell what you want. He watches you and reads you. The king of Syria said, how is it that he keeps figuring me out? And he called his servants and said unto them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He said, look, I need to have a meeting. I got to find out who's the spy in here because somebody is telling the king of Israel my business. That's what he did. He called a meeting. He said, now tell us who's the one. And I like the Bible. It's going to get good right here, saints. Hold on. And he said, notice what it says. Verse 12. And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah. It's this man down there. He's a Christian. The prophet that is in Israel, he tell the king of Israel and the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And I can imagine the man said, now, how in the world can he go into my bedchamber and know what I'm thinking about? God has a way of getting whatever necessary information you need to you to keep you from making a mess of your life. Praise God. God, God has a way of getting you information that nobody else can give you in order to save you from making a mess of your life. Watch this, saints. I love this narrative. Check this out. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. We got to find out where his brother is. And he was told, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, he sent thither horses and chariots and great hosts and came by night. And compassed the city about. They came by night. They said, we got to find this man. We got to find this prophet. What is he doing? And when the servant of the man of God was risen. See, now, can you imagine all these people, this army, they're, they're, they're circling the city around Elisha's house. The man of God's servant, Elisha's servant, wakes up 
And the Bible says he was risen early and he was gone forth. Behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He looked out the window, peeked out and saw all that army. He said, Oh, my master, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to go now? And I can imagine Elisha said, Chill. Just hold on. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We, I, God has our back. Just chill out. And notice what Elijah said. Elisha, Elisha said in verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for, the, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I want you to understand tonight that you and I, if we are on the side of righteousness, we're actually in the majority. It seems like we're in the minority because we're on a world that's in revolt. We're on a sin-sick planet, and the Bible says broad is a road that leads to destruction, and many will be there in at, but there is a narrow road that leads to life, and only few going to find it, and that's on earth. But the whole galaxy, the universe, there are righteous individuals and angels, unfallen beings out there. We're in the majority. That's why you've got to just chill out. God will send angels that excel in might to help you before he lets you go down. He will, send, he will send power, whatever you need. Now watch this, saints. He said, don't worry about it. In verse 17, Elisha prayed this prayer that we need to have prayed for us. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open this man's eyes. Open his eyes so he can see what's going on, what time of day it is. Remember Paul said in Ephesians, I pray that your understanding and that your eyes of enlightenment might be open so that you can understand the hope of your calling. I wish God would give you a wisdom and revelation of the calling that is in you, the hope of your calling, the inheritance of the saints. God has given you a birthright and some of us are trading in for a bowl of Lipton onion soup. God says, I wish your eyes could be open so you could understand what time of day it is. I wish you could understand that you're on the majority. You are on the winning side. You see, I, I remember my brother-in-law, when we watched football, he was younger then. He would always jump back and forth when we watched football. And we would start off watching the game, and he would pick a team, and then I would pick a team. And I, and I would say, okay, now I have this team, and you got that team. And all of a sudden, when my team scores, he jumps on my side. I'm on your side. I said, no, man, you can't do that. I said, I thought you picked that team. Then all of a sudden, when his team scores, he jumped back on his side. When, he, when they win, he on his side. Talking about, we're going to beat y'all. I said, no, you were on this side. And then all of a sudden, my team scored. He jumped back on my side. I said, how long heart she between two opinions? And you know, you have Christians like that, jumping back and forth. But the good news is, we already know who's going to win. I don't know why you keep running with the devil. I don't know why we keep jumping on his side. He's a loser. John said on the Isles of Patmos, I saw both death and hell thrown into the lake of fire and the devil along with his angels were burned up. So you have to remember that God, even though the devil is crazy, he's God's devil. And he can only do as much that God lets him do. See, the devil is on a leash and God, whenever he starts barking, he knows how to shut him up and he knows how to pull him back. See, he runs up against the gate and be barking and scaring us. And God pulls the leash. Said, Get on back over here. And he pulls back. He, he only can do what God allows him to do. And so we are intimidated by him because our eyes are closed. We need eye salve to see. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why are we running from the devil? You see Christians from Sabbath to Sabbath running from the devil. We should be chasing him. We got all power, but we let him chase us. We should be chasing the devil. Come here, devil. Come here, devil. We got the power. The Bible says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, in order to have gates, you have to have walls, and if you have walls, that's a fortress. What the Bible is saying is that the gates of hell shall not stop us. In other words, the devil has our brothers and sisters inside that fortress, and what the Bible is saying is that upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not stop us. What we're going to do as God's people, we're going to kick those gates open, go inside, grab our brothers and sisters, and bring them right back out of the kingdom of the devil, and bring Bring them to the kingdom of life. That's what the Bible means when it says the gates of hell shall not prevent us or prevail against us. They will not stop us because we're on the winning side. I wish we could get our eyes open to realize that. I wish we could understand the power that God has given us.
I wish we would stop praying these little sorry prayers and start praying in the power and the anointing of God. You know, the word anointing scares some Seventh-day Adventists. You say anointing, you, th you start thinking about miracles and healing and tongues. No, no, I'm talking about the anointing of God. You don't believe me. I want to give you a text. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He told me to tell you this in Acts, Isaiah chapter 10. Turn with me there, Isaiah chapter 10, and I want you to look at verse 27. This is the anointing that I'm talking about. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. I want you to turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. And notice what the word of the Lord says. It says this. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of what everybody? The anointing. In other words, when you sing, you ought to be breaking the, the, the yoke and the bondage that's on people. When you preach, there ought to be a breaking of the bondage and the yoke that's on people that you're ministering to. When you sing or when you teach or when you preach, somebody ought to feel the burdens lifted off their shoulders. When Sam gets up here doing that worship, I feel I feel the spirit of God coming in the room. I feel there's anointing in this place. There's nothing wrong with anointing. In fact, Jesus used the word himself when he says in Luke chapter four, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight, the recovering of the sight, the recovering of the sight of the blind. That's our problem. We are blind. And that's why Elisha said, Lord, I wish you could open my servant's eyes so he could see what time of day it is. God says we need the anointing tonight in order to understand the warfare that we're in. Now, now, now saints, I, I'm taking a long time to get to the message. This is what is called the, an, the, an, the antithesis. And what I have done, I've called this the protracted antithesis. I, I've carried it out longer than I need to, and I need to get to the heart of the message. Notice what the Bible says here as we move on. Verse 17, Elijah and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when, the, and when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness, so they can't see. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way. Now, now this is humorous. I don't know about you, but you've got to understand what the Bible is saying. When you understand this Bible, it's so, it's so, it's so liberating. What Elisha did, Elisha said, Lord, these people that came looking for him, he said, Lord, smite them with blindness so they can't see. The Lord said, all right. He smites them with blindness. And then he said, now take us to where we need to go. And Elisha said, all right, this is not the way. Neither is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. Now they came looking for him. Elisha said, y'all looking for a man named Elijah? Okay, I, Lord, smite them with blindness. I'm going to take y'all where he is. Now, <laughs> this is so funny. I don't know. He said, I'm going to take y'all where the man of God is. Now, notice the next verse. And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? In other words, Elisha brought them in the midst of the camp of Israel and they stand in there and their eyes open up and now they see the king, they see the they see the army of Israel all around them. And, and the king of Israel said, Elijah, thanks a lot for hooking us up. Shall we kill them? Elisha said, no, nah, chill. Don't do that. Don't kill them. Don't kill them. Don't don't do that. Notice what it says, verse 22, and he answered, thou shalt not spite, smite them. Wouldest thou smite thee whom thou hast taken captive with the sword? He says, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provisions for them. You know, when you're able to love your enemies, God has really set you free. When you're able to love people who despitefully dog you and use you, that's when you know you're free. See, true freedom is not to do as you please, but true freedom is when what you do what is right pleases you. That's when you're free. 
not to do as you please. I'm going to get grown and do what I want to do. No, no. When you get grown, you're still going to have to go work. And somebody's still going to be telling you what to do. Notice what the Bible says. We move in there. In verse 25. Now, this is where the message is. Where do we go? There was a great famine. Give me 10, 15 more minutes. 10 minutes. There was a great famine in Samaria. Saints, listen to this word. This is good right here. And behold, they besieged it until an ass head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of the calf of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. There was a famine in the land of Israel and they were selling as heads for $28 and dove's dung for $3. Dove's dung. You know what dung is? Amen. Dung. They was, it had gotten so bad in Israel, they were selling dung for $3. And notice, and as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? In other words, he said, You cry for help, girlfriend. There's a famine in the land. How am I going to help you? The Lord ain't even helping me. That's what he said. That's the modern translation. But notice, verse 28, he said, And the king said unto her, Well, excuse me, I am the king. I am royalty. What ail is thee? What's wrong with you? Notice she says, and she answered this woman and said unto me, this woman said to me, give thy son that we may eat him today and we, and we eat my son tomorrow. See, things had gotten so bad in Israel, there was a famine and they were eating children. Don't worry, little children, there's not a famine today. <laughs> but Bible says that. She says, king, what happened was we agreed that we were going to eat my son today and we were going to eat her son tomorrow. Now, we ate my son. Now, tomorrow has come, and she reneging on the deal, and she won't eat her son. She won't put him in the pot to boil him. That's what the word says. And it came to pass, verse 20, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes and passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. And then he said, go. He said, God, do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha. He went looking for Elisha. Notice in verse 33, Elisha said, the king's messenger said, it's over. We might as well just go home. It's over. It's through. It's done. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 7, our scripture reads, a few minutes and I'll let you go. This is where the plot thickens. Then Elisha said, hear ye the word of the Lord. I know it's bad today. I know it seems like you can't make it through. I know it seems like there is no tomorrow. I know it seems like right now that you're hedged in by the walls of difficulties in your life. I know it seems like things are not going to get better for you. I, I, I understand that. That's what Elisha said. But thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be, for, be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. In other words, he says, tomorrow you're going to be able to buy some, some flour for about dollar fifty cents, and you're going to be able to find two measures of barley for 75 cents. Now, just hold on. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. I know it seems like it's difficult right now. I know it seems like you're faced with perplexities in your life, and you don't know which way to go. I know it might seem like there is no tomorrow and somebody might be contemplating suicide. But I say to you today, hold on. God is going to make a way. Hold on, my sister. Hold on, my brother. Don't aggravate your situation by turning to drugs. Don't aggravate the problem by turning to promiscuous lifestyles. Don't aggravate the situation by turning to alcohol and snickety. No, no. Hold on, and God is going to make a way. Just hold on. He's coming. He says, if the Lord. Now, notice, he says, tomorrow, God is going to make a way. But you're always going to have a skeptic come along and say, girl, if I were you, I don't know, I would just give up you've been praying that prayer for 20 years wanting a man and you ain't got a man yet I would just give up <laughs> girl if I were you I would just put him out I wouldn't let no man treat me like that I put him out but hold on don't give up Somebody always going to come up. Now, now, verse 2, I, I like this. Verse 2 again. When you read the Bible with your right mind, you can see a lot there. Now, now, put your right mind thinking cap on. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said. Now, Elijah steps up and says, look, I know it's bad. I know there's a famine. I know people boiling kids and eating children, or children, you know. 
See, I got Ebonics in me. Eat children, that's, you know, children. It's going to be all right. I know it seems like it's bad, but it's going to be all right. That's what Elisha said. But this brother, who's, who, who's king, he's a servant of this king, and he leans on, and notice verse 2, he leans over and he says, the king, he says, then a lord on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, behold, he's going to get facetious with the man of God. If the Lord will make windows in heaven, might this be? He says, yeah, if, if God would just make some windows somewhere, we could get some food. But no food is coming, so how this going to happen? He's a skeptic. Whenever you start trusting in God, you might have relatives who don't believe the way you believe who's going to try to rain on your parade. You're going to have people around you who lack enough faith in God who's going to try to douse your inspiration or your passion. There may be somebody here tonight who's pregnant with possibility, who have many things and potential in their breast and in their bosom, but they will never try because they have been discouraged by people around them. And some people will never accomplish anything because they're afraid to try. There are a lot of people who want to sit back and complain and criticize everybody else, but they don't want to try something themselves. And the moment you get busy doing something, they're going to try to stop you. That's just the way life is. And if you got friends around you who cannot applaud your success or affirm your gifts, then they're not true friends. If you got friends who got the crab mentality who every time you get up somewhere, they want to pull you down. It's a shame how you watch in our churches. You see somebody come in, the Lord bless them to buy a new dress or a new suit, and they come stepping in, they got their do right, their hair is right, and they come in, and they blessed by God, and somebody see them, and the first thing they want to say, look at her, she thinks she cute. Instead of just saying, man, look at sister girlfriend, you look good, girl, go home with your bad self. No, we don't know how to applaud people. We don't know how to, you know, let somebody come driving up in a new car. Look at him. Thank you all that. And he's not even thinking that. You're just thankful that God bless you with some new wheels, but somebody else can't appreciate your blessing. Can't appreciate what God is doing. Somebody is always going to rain on your parade. And if you're not careful, they're going to douse your inspiration and your fire. So I say to you tonight, don't let it happen. Now, as the director of this play, I can shine the lot, lights where I want to. I can change scenes when I want to. Now, you have this king and you have this servant. And Elijah says tomorrow about this time, food going to be available. Food is going to be in the stores and you're going to be able to buy flour for $1.50 and two measures of barley for 75 cents. Just come back to the shopping center tomorrow. About this time, you're going to be able to bring your money and buy food. And this brother says, ha, ain't no food going to be around here. What God going to do? Open up windows and notice what the prophet says. The prophet says, behold, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to eat thereof. Now, y'all remember that. He says, you're going to see it. But you're not going to eat it because you're a skeptic. You don't believe? Tomorrow about this time, I told you it's going to happen. Okay, now the scene shifts. Now, as the director, I'm taking the camera somewhere else. Now, there's a famine in the land. There are four leopards sitting outside the city. They're sitting out there because they're leopards. They can't go in the city because they got to cry out unclean. They're ceremonial unclean. They, they, they can't go in and be around people because they're leopards. But these four men are out there talking to themselves, and they say to themselves, look, brothers, what are we going to do? Now, if we go in the city, we die because the Samaritans going to kill us. If we sit out here with all these groaning hunger pains in our stomach, we're going to die because I haven't eaten in a couple of days. So what are we going to do? Where are we going to go now? They don't know it. But the word of God has come through a prophet that says tomorrow food's going to be available. Now, you may not know how God is going to do it, but the fact is he's going to do it. You see, I don't worry if he's going to do it. I just wonder how you're going to do it this time. You see, if you need some money, maybe God might send a neighbor next door and bring you some money. God might say, wait a minute, I forgot to pay that person. And your boss may give you more money. And somehow God is going to work it out. You may not know how, but God is behind the scenes orchestrating your life of success. God is working this thing out. You just got to hold on. Now watch this. He said, if we sit here, we die. We go in the city, we die. So what are we going to do? Well, by faith, let's just do the best thing we can do. Let's just go into the city. 
I like this. It seems these four lepers said, look, I don't know how we're going to make it. Skin falling off of them, fingers falling off. They barely making it. They looking at each other. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right, man. I just can't wait to get in the city because I'm hungry. I need some food. I mean, I can't wait to get me some steaklets and some, you know, fake steak and phony bologna. If I can just get me a link it, I'll be all right. If I can... If I can just get me a fry pat, maybe if they got some so good, I can drink me some so good and eat me some sanitary and cereal, light and hearty. But I'm hungry. I, I need some morsels. I need some food. And they talk to each other and they just, them four brothers making it and they going into the city by faith. They don't know what's waiting on them, but they said, we're going to move forward by faith. We don't care about the consequences. And sometimes you got to move forward in spite of consequences. You got to just say, Lord, you said you're going to make a way. We're going to go. And, they, and then I can see in my mind's eye, saints, if I was a director, if I was Steven Spielberg and had some money, I would make a movie with four lepers just going into the city. Come on. We're going, <laughs> they're going into the city. They're going to make it. These brothers going into the city. And as they get close to the city, notice what happens. Oh, I like verse 6. For the Lord. For the Lord. For who? For the Lord. For the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Now, there's only four lepers coming to the city. And God made it so that these Syrians, they heard the coming of chariots. They said, oh, no, Israel has hired the Egyptians. They have hired the Hittites. They have hired them as hit men, and they have come to kill us. They said, every man for himself, and they took off running, and they left the camp. Those four lepers, here they come. And they come into the camp, and they look around, and they say, where is everybody? Look what the Lord done done. They, they look around. They look around. They say, there's nobody here. You serious, man? Nah, well, open up your good eye. I know your bad eye fell out. <laughs> Can you see? Yeah, yeah. Nobody's around. And notice what they say. They say, wherefore, they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. These folk took off running for their lives, and these four lepers come in. Here they come in. And verse 8, and when their lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into the tent. They went into one tent and did eat and drink. Did y'all hear that? These four lepers went into one tent, and they said, man, look at here. Pass me some of that steaklet, man. Give me some of that. Pat, they brothers eating. They eating in the tent. And after they leave one tent, they didn't finish. They went to another tent. Oh, man, look at here. Look what God left. Man, pass me some of that cake. Give me some of them rolls. Pass me some of them greens. Pass me some of them beans. Pass me some of that milk. Notice what it says. They got so, they got so full. Not only did they get food, and they carried then silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it. Can you see these brothers? They can barely make it. Now they got renewed strength. They were about to fall out and die. Now they're carrying TVs and VCRs and silver and gold. And the Bible says they go and hide it and they come back. They come back looting. And notice what it says. Verse 9. Then they said one to another. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, we do not well. We're not doing well, brethren. He says, we keep this thing to ourselves. This is a day of good tidings. Look what God has done. He has made a way out of no way. He's blessed us. And if we don't tell somebody else, we're in trouble. Look what God has done for you and me. God has given us upward mobility. He has blessed us. Some of us wear clothes we can't pronounce. We drive cars we can't ra- God has blessed us. Open up doors. Look what he's done for you. Some of y'all got two and three and four jobs. God has blessed you to eat. God has blessed you to live. And if we do not well if we don't go and tell other people how God has opened up doors for you and me. We've got to share the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus has come to save wretched dogs like us. If we tarry to the morning light, some mischief might come to us. 
we got to tell somebody about how good God is. God didn't save us because we were the baddest or the greatest. No, you were the fewest of anybody. God saved us because of his great love. The Bible says God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, not when we got right, not when we straightened our lives out, but when we were still messing up, God died for dogs like us. Came to ransom us, to buy us back. And the Bible says we do not well. We don't tell a dying world that's in revolt about a God who loves them in spite of themselves. I'm so glad tonight that salvation is free. You and I, we are proof in the pudding that God can take nothing and make something out of nothing. You and I are proof in the pudding that no matter how low you have fallen, God can still lift you up. And through the word of God, notice the story does not end there. In verse 16, the Bible says, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of Syrians. In other words, the Bible says they went back and they told everybody else. And notice, leopards were individuals who were considered to be sinners. Leprosy was seen as the stroke of the hand of God. Even these leopards had enough faith in God to go back and tell their people that there was some food in the Syrian camps. And they went back. And notice what the Bible says in verse 16 as we prepare to close. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel. God's word did come to pass. Elijah told them, I told you on tomorrow about this time. You're going to be able to get some flour and some bar barley tomorrow. I told you. God is not man that he would lie. God is not mock. God says, I'm telling you the truth. If you listen to me, I'll show you how to order your steps. God can see into the future and he knows our future before we ever know it. And notice what the Bible says, saints. This thing is so good because it says here, so a measure of flour was sold for a shekel. And two measures of barley for a shekel. Notice what it says in verse 16. If you're there, you see what it says. It says, according to the word of the Lord. If you see that, say amen. That's what the Bible says. It says, according to the word of the Lord. Not according to my word, but according to the word of the Lord. And notice, it doesn't stop there. Remember Elijah's other pronunciation? Remember his other prophecy? He says, not only will a barley be sold and some fine flour be sold, but notice verse 17. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. That was not coincidence. In other words, remember that brother who said, yeah, he going to open up windows somewhere? And we're going to eat. And Elijah said, yeah, you're going to see it, but you're not going to eat of it. The Bible says the king appointed him to hold the gates. It's like being at a supermarket and everybody waiting on the sale. They know it's going to open. And he opens up the door. And the Bible says when he opens the gate, the folk trod him to death. Bam, ran him over and killed him. And the man died just like the prophet said. He said, I told you, you're going to see it, but you're not going to eat thereof. Notice what the Bible says right there in verse 17. And the people trod upon him and the gate and he died. Them people were pretty hungry. When the supermarket opened, they not only killed him, but they knocked the doors off the hinges and smashed him under the door, under the gate, as the word of the Lord said. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know one thing. If you don't know where you're going, all you got to do is listen to the word of God. According to the word of God, so it happened. My Bible tells me here, it says in verse 20, And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. I'll never forget one thing about it. God will not lie. He will not let you down. I told you about that little guy named Reggie. He's something else. Seven years of age. I mean, this guy, he has some wit about him. He's smart, smart guy. I remember right before I was about to go to South Africa, December the 18th, a couple of weeks before that, he told me, he said, he said, Daddy, he said, now, are you going to put up the Christmas tree? I said, yeah, I'm going to do it one day. And he said, are you going to put it up? And, and just for sake, parenthetically, let me just say, just for the sake of those who might wonder about Christmas trees, just for the sake of illustration, we can talk about Christmas trees later. 
He said, Daddy, are you going to put it up? I, I said, son, I, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'll put it up. And then one night he came to me. He said, Dad, you said you were going to put the Christmas tree up tonight. I said, Reggie, I didn't say that. He said, yes, you did, Dad. I heard you. I said, no, I didn't, Reg. I didn't say that. Dad is tired tonight. And I tell you what, I'll do it sometime this week before I leave. And so finally one night, one night, Reggie came to me and said, Daddy, this is what he said. He said, Dad, now, you've been telling me, and I don't know what he said. You've been telling me you're going to put the Christmas tree up. And, and Dad, tonight, would you please put the Christmas tree up? And this is what he said to me. He said, Dad, now, I'm counting on you. <laughs> He said, he said, Dad, I'm counting on you. And then this is what he said to me. This is to add insult to injury. He said, you have never let me down yet. <laughs> now, this little guy, he's about 30, 40 pounds, about so high. He comes to me and says, Dad, I'm counting on you. You have never let me down yet. And I said to myself, hmm. I'm doing all right in his eyes. I've never let him down. And when he put that to me, I said, tonight I cannot start. I'm staying up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, putting up a Christmas tree, because a little boy said, I'm counting on you. I'm tired, bugs falling all over the place, tree almost falling over, but I'm sticking with it because when he wakes up in the morning, he said he can count on me. I wanted to be able to say, Dad, I knew you were going to do it because I can count on you. Brethren and sisters, my brothers and sisters, if I, being a finite being, born in sin, can be moved and, and be moved and impaled like that and compelled by a little guy like that, how much more when you and I come to God and say, God, I'm counting on you. You have never let me down yet. I need you in my life. I'm counting on your word. God will not let you down. He will come through for you tonight. He will not let you down. According to the word of God, God will come through for you. God will bless you. He'll open up doors. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added. Before you call, he says, I will answer. I'll supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, you know what our problem is? We don't want to trust God. We don't want to take him at his word. God says tonight in closing, you can count on me. I have never lost a case. I've never let anybody down. And if you step out on faith, in faith, and expect me to do what I said I'm going to do because I'm true to myself, it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. Tonight, in your own life, you know you need to trust God. You need to trust him with your life. This is not rehearsed and this was not practiced. In fact, this is not even planned, but I'm going to ask Sam, if he doesn't mind, to come. And This is my favorite song. I, I travel and you know I go different places and certain songs mean something to me and I pick them up and they become special to me. This song, I'm running to Jesus. This I'm going to run until I see his face. I, I want him to lead us in this song. And tonight, you need to make a commitment to God that you're going to trust him more. You need to tell the Lord that you're going to have faith and confidence in him and, and expect him to do what he said he's going to do. Tonight, if you would just trust him, if you would just accept his word by faith, he will show you just what course to pursue. Where do we go from here? Number one, we've got to rely on God's word. And number two, you've got to step out in faith, not looking at the, uh, the, the obstacles that face us. But you've got to press on in spite of what you see with your physical eyes. The Bible says, the word of the Lord said, tomorrow about this time, food going to be available. And I say to you, tonight, there's mercy with God. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. That's the word of the Lord. He says, come now, let's reason together. Our biggest problem is we won't come to him that we might have life. Tonight, as they sing this song, I want you to listen to the words one more time. And if you know you're outside the ark of safety, you know you need to make a commitment with God. Not to prolong this appeal, but to tell you to please come and make it right with God. God bless you.